drastic effects on children's brain development. The aspect of brains that grapples with stress gets overstimulated. And when that overstimulation happens, there's a chemical imbalance that occurs. And there's abnormal neurological development that occurs. Even if the kids aren't injured, aren't shot at, it leaves an imprint in them that could limit their learning, limit their relationships. I sat down with the city attorney to talk about his new pilot program in Watts. Immediately after reports of shots being fired, LAPD, community advocates, and therapists with the nonprofit group the Children's Institute arrive on scene. They look for kids and offer free, ongoing therapy to children who may have heard or seen something within 24 hours. We think if we can intervene with these kids in a timely way, we can interrupt what otherwise would be a process that would erode their brain development forever. Now, it's early. We haven't developed metrics by which to assess our efficacy. It's only a few months old, but it's on the right track. And I'm just communicating over the weekend with Laura Drino, a great member of my team who runs this project. Already, we're looking at expanding it dramatically throughout the entire Southeast Division to many of the areas around the schools you just mentioned. Meantime, City Attorney Fuhr recently convened a blue ribbon panel on improving school campus safety. 33 recommendations have been made. He hopes the LA School Board will implement them. A new project in South Los Angeles hopes to honor the rich diversity of African Americans, aiming to put a cultural stamp on the neighborhood of Crenshaw. Amy Liu has more. I'm here on historic Crenshaw Boulevard, where the project Destination Crenshaw will start on 48th Street and span 1.3 miles to 60th Street. Parks, trees, and artwork celebrating African American culture will beautify this part of South LA. Tafari Bain was born and raised in the neighborhood, having graduated from Crenshaw High School. He says he wants to raise his family in the area. I know that, you know, as I get older here, I want to be able to have my kids come down to Crenshaw and hang out and feel, feel welcome here, feel that in public space, their identity is honored and recognized. Bain served as a community activist in South LA and is now a member of the project's advisory council. The Destination Crenshaw Community Advisory Council is a board or a body made up of civic leaders, community leaders, and art leaders from across Los Angeles, um, all, all representing various um, aspects of um, the ways that the Destination Crenshaw project will impact the community or neighborhood. The project is a reaction to the LAX Crenshaw Metro Line being constructed at street level down Crenshaw Boulevard. So the history is that when you split a community with a big construction project like that, you divide the community, you take away a lot of the cohesiveness. Bringing back some of that cohesiveness is a through line across four themes that act as nodes connecting each other. First comes the improvisation node, then the first and dream nodes, and finally the togetherness node ties the community together. So the experience that we hope to create here along Destination Crenshaw is a, um, a dynamic experience. So from three-dimensional sculpture pieces to two-dimensional uh, murals, but also light installations, temporary exhibits. If you think about this 1.3 mile existence, we're gonna use the entire streetscape as a canvas, from benches to crosswalks. The art will incorporate Afrofuturism, street art, and assemblage, which is a form of three-dimensional visual art made of objects. Earl says both established and emerging artists who have a connection to the neighborhood were selected. These people who are going to participate as artists, the stories that we tell are stories that I've lived, people that I know right here in the community in which I reside in. Well, the Crenshaw community really has been, uh, um, really for the last few generations, the heart of the black community in Los Angeles. It's kind of like, you know, it takes a village uh, and, and, and villages have to have spaces for all of its villagers. Um, and I think the opportunity to make, you know, the Crenshaw corridor kind of that, that black community space in that way um, will just help to, you know, tell more of the Los Angeles story. The project also plans to add more than 800 trees, making up 10 acres of new landscaping. Harris Dawson says Metro is making a significant investment along Crenshaw Boulevard with trees and landscaping, while the private sector has contributed about $100 million to the art portion of the project. He believes Destination Crenshaw will help combat gentrification in the neighborhood. We think that uh, gentrification comes in really three forms. One of them is push out, uh, one of them is the inability to move it, people to move in, and the third one is cultural erasure. We think Destination Crenshaw makes cultural erasure completely impossible. 
because uh, we'll brand this uh, district so strongly. Everyone around the world will know that this is the African American community in Los Angeles, the way people know that about Harlem in New York. The project aims to have an opening day in 2020, but Earl says the art creates a foundation that will influence generations to come. A foundation which those who come after us will be able to look back and to learn from and to seek inspiration. Pickups and drop-offs at LAX will never be the same. Construction begins on a new way to avoid gridlock at LA's busiest airport. Gil Reyes explains. Well, here we are 11 a.m.-ish on a weekday morning, and as you can see, traffic is backed up around the terminal area at LAX. What did I expect? It's been like this for years, but local leaders say there is a better way. LAX's upcoming people mover. Check it out. Now this is more like it. Instead of driving, relaxing on board an elevated skyway with scenic views taking you all the way to the airport's terminals. It's coming, LAX's automated people mover. I think traffic will encourage people to take this. Today, you can arrive at the airport and it takes more than a half hour just to get through uh, that horseshoe. But now, you can drop somebody off two blocks away from the airport and they hop on the line, every two minutes it runs and they're already at the terminals quicker than today in a car. Okay. LA Mayor Eric Garcetti and other local leaders break ground on the 2.2 mile fully automated train. It will connect to the upcoming Crenshaw LAX rail line, centralized rent-a-car services, as well as pickup and drop-off sites outside LAX. And inside the airport, the people mover is expected to make transfers between terminals easier. We are going to create, and this is the line, a world-class airport that is a first-class neighbor. Yeah, there you go. Westside Councilman Mike Bonin hopes its usage will also reduce traffic in surrounding neighborhoods. The group Linksys will build the people mover for $5 billion, a good portion of that set aside for minority, women-owned, and veteran-owned businesses. What we will have is a project labor agreement. We'll have local worker hire. We'll have small, small business development. And this is how you build it correctly. And while they're building, be patient. Construction is going to have some impacts. We're going to reduce lanes and we're going to have some road closures. So our, our goal is to make sure that everyone is informed and that there are no surprises during construction. Um, we are going to have real-time information that's distributed to the public and to our passengers. I guarantee that it's going to be well worth the wait and the pain. Expected completion date 2023, maybe even sooner. Construction alone is expected to create 2,000 new jobs. It's a convention that seeks to grow and strengthen the number of deaf and hard of hearing entrepreneurs in art, entertainment, and other industries through connections and partnerships. The Deaf Entrepreneurship Network Convention is a one-stop shop for all sorts of opportunities available in both ASL and English. Take a look. Today we're at the Deaf Entrepreneurship Network Conference, which is an amazing collection of folks from across the United States who are working as deaf entrepreneurs in fashion, in technology, in all kinds of startups, and they're really coming together to learn how to support each other. So the purpose of the Deaf Entrepreneurs Network is to give them a place to exchange knowledge, come together and network all in one place. So far, we've seen some success stories from our first conference. To be able to come to this conference, the Deaf Entrepreneurship Network Conference, again for a second time, I could see how it's grown, and I could see from before having uh, other deaf business owners at the, uh, that conference and seeing the proof that that conference has benefited them at this conference is really a, a positive thing for me. So if you need help starting your business, getting support for your business, finding an incubator, we're hiring and we're buying. I'm just really glad that the city is helping to connect with all of our Angelinos and being able to make sure that everybody feels included in being able to do business with the city and be supported by the city. For people who are hearing and in the general public community, 
you might want to be included in DEN because it's a great way to partner with deaf and hard of hearing business owners and I look forward to developing a partnership in the future. Turning now to a screenwriting workshop for girls that mentors young ladies and inspires them to follow their dreams. So we're here doing a screenwriting workshop surrounded by Oscar. This is our 18th annual character and dialogue workshop, which is amazing to me. It's gone by so fast. Um, we do a different workshop every month. Young people need that kind of inspiration beyond school. They need people that are not their family. We, we have mentors that work with our young people to inspire them and give them a, a whole different view on what life could be for them. It's very much finding each girl and helping her find her unique and individual voice. I like we'll write a little bit of science fiction, a little bit of slice of life, a little bit of crime related things. I love crime. They just get better at writing and better at expressing themselves and better at tapping into who they are no matter what career they choose. This workshop is special to me because screenwriting is what I would like to do with my life and in the future I'd like to be a professional screenwriter. When you see all these girls come here today learning, um, growing, coming out of their shell, asking questions, getting excited about writing, for me uh, there's no better day than a day like today. The Urban Voices Project is changing lives on Skid Row through the joy of singing. Anna Marcos pays a visit to one of its neighborhood sing events. A little Nina Simone song about feeling good never hurt anybody. In fact, the music is helping many here to heal. As the Urban Voices Project holds its weekly neighborhood sing at the Wesley Health Center on Skid Row. It, it gave me goosebumps and butterflies in my somewhere in my stomach or my like my whole esophagus. It lets out the freedom for you to be yourself. You can be yourself that way singing because it comes from you. There's mindfulness and conscious breathing and singing warm-ups that use vibration and music meditation. Music is sometimes the main savior for so many people that are here on the streets, especially in Skid Row. Leof Sofer heads the group, which he, a musician, runs with the help of music therapist Kate Richards Geller and Christopher Mack, who works at the health center. For two years, when I first started down here in 2003, I would cry every day. And it, just because of the condition of the people and see how the people were hurting. And so it touched me and I cried every day for two years. And then I stopped crying. And when I stopped crying, I started singing. And so I would sing every day and it made me feel better. It was Mac and Sofer who started the Urban Voices Project six years ago with funds from the Colburn School of Music. Eight weeks later, the money and the program went away, but they wanted to keep it going. And there was days when we'd show up and nobody's in the room and we'd do the same thing, look at each other, if you show up next week, I'll show up next week. This was my co-founder, Christopher Mack, and I pulling this out from the bottoms of our hearts and our own wallets. Six years later, the program has continued to grow and is now training more teachers. When I saw the choir perform at this festival, uh, I saw right away the joy, the hope, the resilience, and the way that the music brought them all together. It's, it's, it's really rough out uh, on the streets, and the community that we build gives people a sense of belonging. Give vision, give vision. Some of the singers have gone on to join the group's performance ensemble, which performs throughout L.A. 
The singers are even changing perspectives on Skid Row. Instead of reaching out for help, they're reaching out to help others with joy and music. You can find healing, you can find wellness, you can find utter joy and love. Sometimes the people here even sing to each other. It will never be that moment again. The emotion and how everybody was just, it was just, everybody was in unison and it was just beautiful. Everything was just perfect. I've always had trouble looking at people in the eyes. That's why that was moving to me, um, looking into someone else's eyes and then also singing to someone else, like I'm letting you inside. The Urban Voices Project, making people feel better one voice at a time. The Urban Voices Project is expanding to other places like MLK Hospital in South LA, the Central Library, and Venice. For more information, visit urbanvoicesproject.org. Want to be an engineer? How about one for the city of Los Angeles? An engineering contest luring some of LA's best and brightest young people aims to build a bridge to their future careers. Gil Reyes has more. Just how much pressure can these bridges and the kids who've built them withstand? We're about to find out in this engineering competition with school pride and a trip to the finals at stake. For several weeks, students toiled after school and on weekends to make their miniature wooden bridges as shatterproof as possible. All for this, LA's 18th annual bridge building contest. It's sponsored by the city's Bureau of Engineering. Well, the main category is the bridge's efficiency. That's how much weight it's able to hold over how much the bridge weighs. And that determines who will go to the international contest. Tough break for most of the kids. Five LA high schools are competing, but only the first and second place teams advance to the finals in Baltimore. No matter who wins, LA City hopes to come out on top. This is exactly what we want to do, get an open and early start for engineers to look into this career as their goal, as their major, as their future, and then come back to the city of L.A. and work for the city of L.A. as public servants, but in an engineer capacity. I decided to stick with it because I know that it'll help me decide what I want to do, and I know since engineering's on my options of career that I would want to pursue. Student Angelica Rios should know. The city is hiring more women and people of color. The trend has been changing pretty good. So lately we have hired more than 50% of the engineers who are female. So this is a great start for us. Congratulations to first place winners Arlita High School. They are pumped to be headed to the finals in April. I saw the results up there. I, I just lost it. <laughs> a little celebration with friends and then it's off to the international competition and an all-expenses-paid trip to Maryland. Hopefully, L.A. can bring home the gold. Congratulations to second-place team Los Angeles High School. They're also headed to the finals. The students were mentored by workers at the Bureau of Engineering to help create their projects. Get ready to get fit! New exercise equipment at the Green Meadows Recreation Center is giving residents a chance to get their hearts pumping while improving their overall health. This has been a long time coming and the community is really excited that today is the day that we get a chance to unveil the exercise equipment here at Green Meadows Recreation Center. We're so excited to have this fitness center here for our community residents, both young and old, so they can stay fit and healthy. Of course, it's gonna be very useful and I would love to invite everybody in the community, uh, all the people that, that know this park to come along and use this um, exercise equipment. Come on down. Come on down. <laughs> Join us. <laughs>
Get your motor running at a European car show, enjoy live bands and food trucks at the annual Off Sunset Festival, and get your weekend started with a classic disco vibe. All this and things to do. The 8th annual European car show returns to the Miracle Mile with hashtag Euro19. This one-day event for car enthusiasts will feature European automobiles of all makes and models, old and new, from Audi to Volvo. Don't miss hashtag Euro19 happening at the Peterson Automotive Museum on 6060 Wilshire Boulevard. The show starts at 9 a.m. on Sunday, March 31st. For tickets, visit eventbrite.com. It's costume fun with an LGBT twist at the 7th annual Off Sunset Festival. Come enjoy live bands, gourmet food trucks, specialty beers, and lots of leather gear at this premier LA leather street fair. It's all happening Sunday, March 31st, beginning at noon. The festival is located at Sunset Junction on 4219 Santa Monica Boulevard. For details, visit offsunsetfestival.com. Get into the groove with the World 70 Party, one of LA's most popular dance events. Join guest DJ Selwyn Hines as he drops your favorite Afrobeat, salsa, reggae, classic disco, and more. It's all happening at World 70 for one night only, Friday, March 29th, beginning at 9 p.m. The party kicks off at the Library Bar in the Mayfair Hotel, located at 1256 West 7th Street. RSVP for your free tickets at eventbrite.com. And that's a look at some things to do. Prom season is an exciting time for many high school students, but for some students whose families are facing financial hardships, the costs can sometimes be more than they can afford. That's why the LA City Attorney's Office, along with the LAPD, have stepped in to help out. My office, the city attorney's office, coordinated with LAPD to host a prom closet. All of the merchandise that we have here, it's mostly brand new. Uh, some are gently used and they're generously donated by various shops throughout the city. Um, so what we really try to do is transform this community room into a boutique. They don't feel like these dresses, these suits are being given to them. They feel like they're shopping for an outfit like any other high schooler would. Before we started this project, we saw that there were similar projects throughout the country, but most of them really only served girls when the boys have a really great need as well. It's, um, a lot of these kids, it's their first time wearing a suit, wearing a tie. You see these kids come in and they're so, so grateful um, for being able to participate in this. I feel like every girl is just, you know, as soon as she hears prom, she like starts thinking of like the first dress she's gonna put on and like imagining in her head how it's gonna picture. Spending a lot of money on senior year is not really an option, so finding resources like this is really great. This is a very expensive cost for at this time of year. A lot of kids uh, forego their proms because they can't afford them, whether they can't buy a dress or can't buy a suit. And us being able to provide them that uh, lightens the load for the parents and for the kids. I'm a single mom, and so any help that I can get, it helps. So I'm, I'm appreciative of, of this whole program. The important part is um, for a lot of these kids who grow up in communities where maybe there's a little bit of a distrust of law enforcement or they're not familiar with law enforcement, this helps them have positive interactions with police officers. They're coming to the station, they're interacting with them, they're teaching them how to tie ties. So you can imagine how this stays with them for years to come. Police officers are supposed to, you know, protect the streets and anything, but like offering Free resources for prom is just the extra mile that they go to to help us and support us. Watching kids come in, find a dress, it makes them so happy. Leaving just, just in tears that they were able to get that. So that, that's a really big, uh, it pulls on your heartstrings. And for us to be able to bring that to the community, it's big. That's it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay. From all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more of LA This Week.
There are things in every city that speaks to the heart and soul of every community. In San Francisco, it is the Golden Gate Bridge. In Chicago, it's the Beam. In New York, it is the Statue of Liberty. In South Los Angeles, it's the Watts Towers. Hi, my name is Rosie Lee Hooks. I'm director of the Watts Towers Arts Center campus. Come visit the Watts Towers Arts Center campus where you'll see exhibitions, the Watts Towers of Simon Ordea, our garden studio with turtles and tortoises and California natives. This massive man-made sculpture is made of steel, covered with mortar, and embellished with mosaic tiles, glass, clay, shells, and rocks. The Watts Towers are truly unique and receive cultural heritage monument status from the city of Los Angeles in 1963. Like the community, the Watts Towers have a strong foundation and recycles different types of materials to create something breathtakingly beautiful. The Watts Towers Art Center is a guardian of the Watts Towers. It provides programs designed for cultural enrichment and museum and art education to the Los Angeles community and the world at large. With the recent adaption of the South Los Angeles and Southeast Los Angeles community plans, the Watts Towers Art Center community will continue to shine and serve as the pulse of the community.
Good morning, good morning. If everybody would, te would, would please take a seat. Today is Tuesday, March 26th. I want to welcome you to City Hall. Uh, Mr. Clerk, we have a quorum. Would you please call a roll? Blumenfield, Bonabusca, and Osadio, Harris, Austin, Wiesar, Koresko, Crane, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Ruth, Smith, and Wesson. 11 members president, present and a quorum, Mr. President. It looks like this is going to be one of those days. Huh? <laughs> All right, let's start off um, at what, first order of business. Approval of the minutes. Rodriguez moves, Rue seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Price moves, O'Farrell seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, today is Tuesday and time for the flag salute. Why don't we all rise? We'll be led today by Ms. Rodriguez in our flag salute. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. If you all please face the flag, put your right hand over your heart, ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Let's, uh, Mr. Clerk, go through the agenda. Very good, sir. Items 1 through 12 are items noticed for public hearing. Do you have cards? Uh, cards on items 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, and 12, sir. Let's hold those items and uh, prepare to vote on the remaining. Are we ready? Let's vote on the remaining items. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Continue, please. Mr. President, items 13 and 14 are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, let's prepare to vote M on those M items. Mr. President, pardon me. Uh, item 14 has uh, two committee reports. A uh, motion is required. Okay, I'll move. Those would be a budget and finance committee report and a public works and gang reduction committee report. So I'll move and is Mr. Bonin here, we'll get Mr. Bonin to second. Uh, so let's take up 13 and 14, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Continue. Mr. President, items 15 through 44 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this council. Uh, do you have cards on uh, these items? Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. Let's call number 31 special, please. Let's hold 31 for Mr. Smith. Yes. Uh, cards on 16, 17, 20, 22, 24, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 38, 40, and 42, sir. Okay, let's hold those items. And let's prepare to vote on the remaining items. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Um, that brings us where, Mr. Clerk? Mr. President, that takes council back to presentations. Items called special or general public comment for items not okay, on council's Sergeants, agenda. Okay, Sergeant, if you could remove the ropes, let's uh, call up Mr. Previn. Good times. Mr. Previn, you have items 1B through 1H. Then you have 2, 3, 8, 9, 12, 16, 17, 20, 22, 24, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 38, 40, and 42. Yes, Mr. Buscaino. Sorry, Mr. President, but before we uh, bring up Mr. Predman, I do um, want to recognize we just appointed Nicholas Roxborough to the Board of Harbor Commissioners. I want to recognize him and airport. thank him. I'm sorry, this not air airport commissioner, <laughs> not Harbor. We're trying to already recruit you down south, Commissioner. Let's give so him a that, round we, of applause. We recognize you, congratulate you. He's joined by his beautiful family. Thank you for your service to our city. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Previn. And Mr. President, while he's making his way up, there's been a request to send item 39 forthwith, sir. No problem. Mr. Previn. Okay, thank you. It's Eric Previn from CD2. Um, 
I know that Krikorian wrote a little note about the budget. I just want to make sure that people are entitled to speak after each department. Just for stay a on the That's item. fine. That is on the agenda, sir. Pay Go attention. Ahead. That's okay. Item number one is your lean derby today. And I'm happy to say uh, with strong posting from Mitchell Farrell at $3,666 was nice, but he couldn't get it done. That's bronze. We have uh, a strong player from Mr. Rue at $3,740 uh, $3, lean against a constituent. But the winner, uh, once again, Mr. Cedillo at $3,788. And I'd just like to say thank you to the airport commissioner Bonin for conducting this press conference during my comments. I do appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, item number 12 would be your buzz. Buzz is synonymous with why not? Why not allow uh, the liquor license to be expanded from beer and wine to hard cocktails. I, I can't see a reason. This is in an area where there's only 99 or so crimes a year compared to 199. Don't hold me to the exact numbers, but it's below the actual average. So I think, uh, you know, this is in an upscale area. Now, it is in a ground floor area where youth can walk into the facility, but Buscay, you know, that's not a problem because we got a little stanchion, something like this that will keep them from getting to the, to the good stuff. So I don't see a problem, once again, with, uh, with rolling such a thing out. Now, um, in item number, oh, I guess you've got a number of lighting district uh, protests, which is very exciting. April 16th is the date for all of the sort of well-off districts who have figured it out that you can protest and then come down here and vote. So that would include CD, well, we're not a wealthy district, but we are smart, CD2, CD4, one of the wealthiest, David Rue's district, one of the Three Little Kings, Mitchell Farrell's district, CD13, and Blumenfield's district, uh, number three, where we're doing just a great job with the Madrid Theater, all sorts of moving things along, including a hockey uh, program. We're going to get a hockey rink out there, which I think everybody is very excited about. We're not that excited about the CRLA, how do we call it, you know, miscalculations. I know that what we're doing now is pushing hard to get this money out the door so that I guess MRT is leading a charge to have... Uh, you know, CRA come back. He wants to once again go after the tax to set up these programs that were designed to stimulate, you know, against blight, but as we know, were riddled, and I want to say the term riddled with corruption and therefore phased out. But it's time to roll it back in. Now, in terms of the liquor license, where is Coretz? It's hard without everybody present, but Coretz does not want to party until two, beyond 2 a.m., and I don't blame him, quite frankly. Now, the mayor. The mayor is a little different when it comes to the reveling. The mayor wants to experiment with going later till four or five in the morning. And so I just hope that we can find some kind of a, a balance there. I don't like to see our council members quibble with one another. Um, I, think it's, I think it sends a message that, okay. Let's give him his uh, one minute for general public comment. And Mr. And President, this, act Mr. Closed. Previn, this concludes Malta. Thank you. What was he, uh, Fobel saying? Okay. City attorney uh, has a tough job. It's always been a tough job because he wears multiple hats. But the Los Angeles Times and others have discovered that Tom Peters, who was one of his chief top guys, sir, you'll remember the case Godefroy versus City of Los Angeles, where Brian Panish uh, at the firm of Panish, uh, Boyle, and Shea, I believe, Panish, Shea, Boyle, you know, settled a case for $6.5 million. The mayor was out of town reveling, evidently, but you signed it. And it's a dirty, dirty deed, sir. But here's the problem. This law firm was, I don't want to say colluding, because collusion is not in fashion these days, but they were working cooperatively with Tom Peters. Now, they, they were re they're called referral fees. This, sir, Bonin, I know you and Buscay, smells to high heaven. I mean, we are appalled because there's a few people who come down here and wonder what is going on with this legal fighting, and we require due diligence from the council, and the council consistently looks down and chit-chats during these moments where we're rolling out real concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Previn. Okay, Mr. Herman, you have one minute general public comment. Followed by. Fuck the police. That's right. When you have city attorney who's going bad, sour, corrupted with attorney fees. That's the greatest news, Mr. Fobble, off of 80 North Euclid and Union. Fuck you and your fucking little chateau up there on the corner of Pasadena. And fuck all you. 
What the fuck are you doing for us who are homeless? Why the fuck is nobody representing Sedillo District 1 at LAPD Commission? And that white billionaire motherfucker, Steve Sobroth, tells me I'm trying to help homeless. Fuck you. 42 USC 1983, Baltimore Police versus United States of America, and I versus you, you fucking creep. You, city attorney. Because you and those fucking corrupted, stupid-looking motherfuckers like you and that fat cunt bitches in here have been stealing money from the public. Corruption up the ass the way you take thank it, you. Mr. Fuck. Thank you. Thank you. So do I have Alan uh, Yesman and Elizabeth Peterson? Please come forward. Elizabeth, are you here? Go ahead, sir. Good morning, sir. Um... Uh, we receive an invoice from City $350, which I s send a check to them. A couple months later, I receive a letter that they did not receive the, any payments, and they charge us $928 late fee, interest, whatever it was because of that $350. I did send a replacement check, ASAP, and they asked me to send a stop payment on the check and other information which I provided them with. And after, I believe, more than a year or so, they sending me again this letter that I'm charged $928 because of the late fee and interest. So I'm here to dispute that. Okay, well, the, uh, give me the address again. It's 11041 Stratton. Okay. All right. That's, that's 1F. Okay. So why don't we... Uh, so... If you would go to your right, you'll see a, a woman in a white top. Why don't you begin a conversation with her? And I, we'll figure out before we adjourn what kind of action we're going to take on that. So thank you. You. See, you see her to my right? Thank you, Mr. Okay. President. Okay. So do I have uh, Elizabeth Peterson? Hi. Good morning. Nick Leathers for Elizabeth Peterson, item 12. This is for a PCN for 460 South Spring Street. This site's located on 5th and Spring on the ground floor of the Rowan Condo Building. Uh, in May 2018, the applicant received a new CEP to allow for the upgrade of off-site sales of beer and wine to a full line of alcoholic beverage sales. The operation has been in business for seven years. The applicant maintains a good standing with ABC. For outreach, we've been working with CD14, LAPD Downtown Vice, and the Downtown LA Neighborhood Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have an Aton? Aton, where are you? Come on up. You signed up to speak? Come on. Aton, just walk through the. Come to the center. Good morning. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, address uh, this issue. I, um, I'm in compliance. I have the permits. Um, if I can show these papers, um, I have the permits uh, that I've started, that I've started the process and uh, all the plans for uh, my uh, garage conversion. Um, there's some fees that are assessed for like $2,400. I was never aware that uh, those fees were, were assessed to me. Um, all the notices were sent to the wrong address. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, hearing notice, uh, it was sent to uh, 6222 Mammoth, which I haven't been living there for like the last 10 years. Okay, uh, let me interrupt you if I may for a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, in conversation with the council office from that area, they have recommended that we continue this for 30 days. Okay. So we would continue this until 
April 30th, sir. April 30th, so it's a little more than that. And you can have a conversation with the representatives from Council District 5. Now, you said, or in, in 30 days? Mr. See this bearded gentleman to your right? Okay, yes. so we're going to continue this so there'll be no action until April 30th, but you can begin by speaking with the gentleman in front of you. I think so. Okay? You, thank you. All right. Mr. So, President, item 1I has also been recommended uh, to, excuse me, 1J has also been recommended to be continued to April 30th. Would you like to do that uh, now one as well, J? sir? Yes, sir. Okay, without objection, we'll continue that as well. Okay, that concludes general public comment. Okay, let's vote on some of our items here. Let's uh, take up items 2, 3, 8, and 9, and 12. 2, 3, 8, 9, and 12. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Now let's move forward and vote on items 16, 17, 20, 22, and 24. Please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Ms. Rodriguez. Mr. President, 29 forthwith, please. <coughs> forthwith on that item. Now let's vote on items 31 through 34, 31, 32, 33, and 34. Okay, in fact, what we'll do, let's vote on, let's scratch that. We'll do items 32, 33, and 34. So please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Now we'll move on to items 36, 37, 38, 40, and 42. On those items, please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. So now let's go back to item 31. On 31, please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes, one no. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Herman, you have one minute on item one. Ladies and gentlemen, Angelinos, did you know that we are adding still banners as a campaign? When we have politicians, like in Mike Fear's office, attorneys that Let's are- Let's stick on the item, stay, stay on the item. So this, non-encouraging participation of the Los Angeles Municipal Code 61-132 under my Municipal Code of 42 U.S.C. 1983, fuck your code, is to tell the street banner program to understand that niggers in Tarzana like you, Mr. So-called Bloomfield, and your fucking cunt coup, know better that neighborhoods don't want these fucking flags because they're anti So, Mr. Mr. Herman, number one is on the liens. Okay, thank you. Uh, your time is over. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Sergeants, please have him remain, return to his seat. Okay, Mr. Clerk, I've been informed we're going to continue item 1F for 30 days. April 30th, sir. Yes. And now let's vote on the remaining items. 
Let's M Mr. On, on item one, other than the ones that have been continued. Very good, sir. Uh, that would leave item 1A, and the recommendation is to uh, reduce the lien to $3,281.64. Uh, item 1B, to receive and file in as much as the lien was partially rescinded and paid. Item 1C, to receive and file in as much as the lien was paid in full. 1D, to reduce the lien to $3,662.92. Item 1E, to reduce the lien to $2,000, uh, excuse me, $2,018.99. Uh, item 1G to receive and file in as much as the lien was paid in full. And item 1H to reduce the lien to $3,784.52. Okay, let's prepare to vote on the item. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tab you late. 13 ayes. Thank you. Okay, why don't we, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Mr. Blumenfield at this time for a presentation. And uh, Mr. City Attorney, now just let me restate, that concludes general public comment along with our multi. Of course. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. We're here today, uh, we wanted to declare this month as Red Cross Month. While the Red Cross was founded in 1881, which for those of you who do the math is 138 years ago by Clara Barton, it was in 1943, just 76 years ago, that President Franklin D. Roosevelt proclaimed March as Red Cross Month and called on Americans to make a donation, to volunteer, to take a class, to give blood as well as recognize and thank American Red Cross volunteers and donors who give of themselves to support our community in times of need. Ever since then, uh, every president has continued this tradition, and uh, we are taking that tradition local, and we are making, this, we are making sure that our local Red Cross uh, knows that this month is Red Cross Month. Now, the organization was established as a humanitarian organization guided by seven fundamental principles, including humanity, impartiality, independence, to provide services to those in need, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or citizenship status. You'd probably be surprised by the breadth of activities that the Red Cross does. Um, I myself was, uh, worked for the Red Cross back in the summer of 1987. Uh, I was surveying burned down uh, apartments, just one of the many things that, uh, that folks do as part of the Red Cross. Every year, the Red Cross, with over 370,000 volunteers, responds to an average of more than 62,000 disasters across the country, from small home fires to dev devastating massive disasters. They handle over 33,000 emergency calls every year. They even collect an average of 147,000 units of blood from generous blood donors. Look, they do everything you can imagine. They do fires, they do floods, they do volcanoes, they do earthquakes, they do epidemics. You can imagine it as a disaster, they will be here uh, to help us out. Uh, and that is, that is one of the amazing things about the Red Cross. Um, just several months ago, I was able to see firsthand uh, what they were capable of doing. It's when I got to, to work with Raul over here on a number of things. On the, on the morning of November 8th, the first day of the fires, our brave, while our brave first responders were in the field, the Red Cross and their volunteers were on the ground. They were mobilized and bringing comfort and food and shelter to the folks who were told to just leave their homes. Folks who didn't know what they would do next, where they would go, when they would be able to return back to their home. Overnight, evacuees were told to leave their homes and many were housed in my district during that fire at Taft High School, at Pierce College, at Canoga Park High School. And we had several hundred animals, from horses to dogs to, yes, even a turtle, which we did find a place for uh, shelter at Pierce College. Now, my team worked with them uh, hand in glove. They set up the shelters, and we, were, we created a centralized donation hub for folks who wanted to, to help with the effort. Uh, and it was that partnership we were able to get the supplies to the shelters when they needed it, 
uh, where they needed it and at the right time, which was, which was critical for the whole overall effort. We saw incredible generosity from our community. Uh, overall, the fires, as you know, they burned over 70,000 acres and about 250,000 people were evacuated. But for the Red Cross, for them, it was just another day, another week of service. They were ready to help. Um, now, they've moved into a new area as well. In addition to the recovery, which we all know and they're famous for, they're moved into preparedness. And in fact, since uh, 2015, they launched Prepare SoCal uh, right here in this area. And that's where they do a public information campaign, where they do training. They get us ready because they know it's not a question of if, it is a question of when. So for all of they do, for all they do, and in keeping with Franklin Delano Roosevelt's tradition of honoring the Red Cross and declaring this month, we here in the city are going to declare this month, of March, Red Cross Month, and I have a certificate for you, but before we get to that, uh, we're here with Raul, who is the executive director for the Valley Chapters, and Renee, who is a, a volunteer as well, and, and I believe Raul's gonna say a few words. Thank you. Let, me, let me jump in before Raul Clado speaks and just say that uh, we all recognize the good works of the Red Cross. I mean, unquestioned. But I just wanna say from a personal perspective, knowing Raul as long as I have, he's the, ter the perfect person to be in this operation. He's very proactive, very assertive when he needs to be and I'm just really happy for his growth and the work that he's doing that will not just benefit the Valley. He works with the organizations that work in our part of town as well. And because of his innovative ideas, a lot of people will be using them. So anyway, Raul, I'm pr proud of you. you. Uh, don't know how you do so much stuff, but you do. So anyway, welcome, let's give Red Cross volunteer and executive director round of applause. Let's give him a round of applause for the service to the city of LA. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Council Member Bloomingfield. Um, seeing you in action and your team is also to be saluted and applauded as well. Thank you for your leadership. Um, I also want to thank uh, Council Member Kern Price, uh, Harris Dawson, Cedillo, you, Mr. President, Council Member, uh, Monica Rodriguez, Nuri Martinez, um, we have coalitions in all of your districts. Uh, three, four years ago, we looked at the most vulnerable communities across LA County and we found some of them in your districts. You guys have been amazing partners. We've grown now to go into the San Gabriel Valley as well and other neighboring cities, but this Prepare SoCal and Prepare LA campaign couldn't happen without the partnerships that we have here in the city of Los Angeles. And for that, we thank you. We have been out there through the Creek Fire recently, the Woolsey Fire, and we will always continue to be there after a major crisis or a disaster. But something that we've also been doing, especially down in South LA with my friend Renee Henderson from Community Coalition, let's give her a big round of applause. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. Coco is in the house. Renee um, and a team down in South LA in Council Districts 8 and 9 have recently installed in two, two rounds around South Park and Maya Angela High School over a thousand free home smoke alarms. And so as the council member mentioned, we will always be there during and after a disaster, but it's time that we come together on the preparedness side so that we can be a more resilient Los Angeles. Once again, on behalf of the entire LA region, our CEO, Jared Barrios, thank you all very much. Thank you, let's give him another round of applause. Renee, thank you, and Community Coalition as well. Mr. President, yes. there's, there's been a request to uh, reconsider item number 30 and then refer it back to the Housing Committee. Okay, so uh, let's vote on reconsideration. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. And so without objection, let us refer that to the Housing Committee. Mr. Clerk, uh, what is before this council? Mr. President, council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted, they are referred. 
Announcements, members, announcements. No announcements if everybody could. Mr. Buscaino. Okay, if everybody could please rise for adjourning motions. If everybody in the council chambers could please rise. I'd like to recognize Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Colleagues, I ask that um, we rise and adjourn in memory of Mary Amalfitano, um, dedicated her life to serving the community of San Pedro for decades. Born in New York City in 1922, she moved to California with her family in 1934, making San Pedro their new home. She graduated from San Pedro High School in 1940. Miss um, Amalfitano decided to stay in San Pedro, contribute her part to the community, had welcomed her family with open arms while making a home of her own with her husband, Tom Amalfitano. She is best known for her hard work and dedication um, and commitment to the business, the Norms Landing Fish Market, and later, uh, as we all know it today, the San Pedro Fish Market and Restaurant, where she worked until age 90. Um, she was an, an incredible mother figure, grandmother figure to us all, and throughout her life, she was an active member of the community, a regular at the Elks Club, a Reds Hat, and Wednesday Morning Club. She raised two children, Tommy and Rosemary, and um, has four grandchildren and 11 great-grandchildren. Her services are happening as we speak at Mary Star of the Sea Parish. Our hearts go out to Mary, uh, Tommy, Rosemary, all her friends, her family, and colleagues, and the entire San Pedro Fish Market family. May she rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm still looking to my left to see if there are any more adjournings to my left. Now looking to my right. Don't see any. This uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.